So uh, just a brief uh, outline of my talk today. First, I'm just going to touch on general uh, Arnold Chiari malformation uh, information. I think that Rich covered that nicely just a minute ago, uh, but I will touch on that. And then uh, I'm going to get into uh, the relationship between Chiari and fibromyalgia. Uh, they're both uh, obviously associated with pain and, and there is a substantial amount of overlap. Then we're going to talk about Chiari and sleep and then wrap it up with a summary. And uh, this is, these are the classifications that Rich just went through. Uh, we're going to be focusing really, for the most part, in the research that I'm going to be presenting on type 1 Chiari, which typically presents in early adulthood. As Rich mentioned, type 3 is uh, quite rare. And uh, Rich also uh, indicated what Chiari is, which I think everybody in this room is familiar with. Uh, but for the purposes of our research project here, uh, we define Chiari malformation as a five millimeter or greater descent of the cerebellar tonsils below the Bayesian epistian line, which is this line here at the base of the skull. And uh, as you all know, uh, between 40 and 80 percent of individuals with Chiari malformations will have comorbid uh, syringomyelia. Um, Chiari malformations are associated with many symptoms. I think most typically would be a crushing posterior uh, headache. Uh, but there also can be visual symptoms, double vision, visual field uh, defects, uh, and um, diplopia or double vision, um, or uh, it, so a blurriness of vision, as well as uh, auditory complaints, uh, ringing in the ears, uh, dizziness, uh, and then lastly, sleep apnea, swallowing difficulties, and things of that nature. So those are just a few of the symptoms that can be typically seen with this disorder. And this is just an example uh, of a sagittal MRI of an individual with a Chiari before here in A and after a decompressive surgery. And you can see resumption of uh, CSF flow posterior to the cord here following decompression. And we did do CNA MRIs on our uh, subjects in uh, one of the studies that I'm going to be presenting to you. So the first uh, question that we had uh, in our research project was, the notion of whether or not Chiari malformations are associated with uh, fibromyalgia. Um, you know, they, we were interested in two things. One, you know, what are the, the signs, objective uh, uh, signs and the subjective symptoms that are seen uh, in Chiari and, and it, are seen in FM and do they overlap in, in patients with Chiari? And then uh, also, do patients with fibromyalgia uh, have Chiari as a possible explanation for their symptoms? And this research uh, uh, was spurned on by Deidre Buckwald in the Department of Medicine because she was particularly uh, interested and concerned about the fact that many individuals with uh, fibromyalgia were undergoing decompressive uh, craniectomies for treatment of their fibromyalgia with a without a lot of evidence to suggest that this is clearly associated. So what is fibromyalgia? Well, it's chronic widespread pain lasting at least three months. It has to involve uh, four quadrants uh, of the body, uh, and it has to uh, have tender point uh, pain in 11 out of 18 of these regions that I'm showing you here. It's, it affects about 2% of the population, predominantly women. Many people that have it uh, will uh, state that it began after a traumatic injury of some kind. Some you know, whiplash types of injuries uh, are commonly reported. So for our study, uh, which uh, I quoted down here, um, our cases were, uh, th they had to be greater than or equal to 18 years old. They had to have fibromyalgia by self-report or medical record review, and their diagnosis was verified by uh, conf confirming uh, or conforming to ACR, American College of Rheumatology criteria. Controls also had to be greater than 18 years old without complaints of chronic widespread pain or fatigue. And we did a number of self-report questionnaires and symptoms, and then I did a blinded neurological exam on uh, every one of the subjects in this study. Here are the study demographics. You can see we had uh, 166 individuals with fibromyalgia, 66 controls. Uh, the age, uh, the fibromyalgia group was a little bit older, more female, and uh, a little more Caucasian, and these factors were adjusted for in the final analysis, or these differences were adjusted for in the final analysis. Uh, 
this is a busy slide, but what I want you to focus on here, so these are the symptoms that these individuals were uh, indicating that they were having. And as you can see, almost all of these are st statistically significantly different between those without FM and those with FM. Uh, and I'm just highlighting here some of the more prevalent symptoms uh, in the FM group, which is bright light bothering the eyes or photophobia, poor balance here at 63%. Tingling in, in the arms and legs and numbness, uh, over 50% for both of those. And then weakness in the arms and legs, uh, approaching 60%. So lots and lots of uh, neurological symptoms in patients with fibromyalgia. So what about uh, the physical exam? Uh, and the main, uh, I'm just going to highlight the significant differences here. Uh, we found that in examination of cranial nerves 9 and 10, uh, that hoarseness uh, in particular was much more common in the FM group than the no FM group. And uh, also we found uh, sensory abnormalities, which were predominantly driven by impaired uh, vibratory temperature and pinprick uh, sensation. Motor abnormalities, which were prominently driven by uh, weakness uh, found on exam, uh, as well as imp impaired fine motor control. And then lastly, uh, gait uh, was more abnormal in the FM group, particularly tandem gait, where we had uh, people walking, touching heel to toe in a straight line. So we did find lots of, of uh, subjective symptoms. We found objective findings on the, uh, our neurological examination. And then we were interested, well, how well do these correlate? Uh, are are this, the symptoms that these individuals are indicating, do they correlate with what we're finding on our exam? And the answer to that was yes, that the numbness, uh, complaint of numbness in any location and tingling in the arms or legs correlated with anesthesia, analgesia, or impairments in vibratory temperature or pinprick sensation, uh, poor balance, poor coordination and weakness in the arms and legs correlated positively with uh, Romberg sign, ataxia, impaired proprioception or abnormal tandem gait and weakness. The Romberg sign, ataxia, and proprioception, these are all just kind of balance measures, so having troubles with, with keeping your, your balance. So um, what we found in this study was that FM is associated with objective findings on neurological examination. Uh, symptoms were more common in the FM patients than in controls that these signs and symptoms in many cases did correlate. So it brought us to the question uh, that we kind of got to at the end of that study, which was could uh, Chiari uh, malformations in FM patients explain these findings? And when we found many of these signs and symptoms were, that we found in the FM group could be things that individuals with Chiari would, would complain of. So that brought us to our next study where we uh, in these uh, same individuals, um, we uh, characterized their headaches and then we performed sagittal and axial T1 and T2 MRI of the brain and cervical spine down to C4 and we looked at CSF flow vo velocity and direction. These are the demographic characteristics uh, which are similar to what they were in the previous study I just showed and again uh, that the uh, FM group was a little older, more female, and more Caucasian. Again, we controlled for these factors uh, in the analysis. And if you look at the headache symptoms, uh, what I'd like to point out here is that um, uh, many of the headache characteristics in the FM group would be things that we would probably consider fairly typical for headaches of people that have Chiari malformation. So uh, in particular, positionality. So if the head was down or lying down and standing was associated with a, a headache and then Valsalva maneuvering such as uh, straining uh, and sneezing. So um, this is just f providing further support to our hypothesis that maybe Chiari malformations are present in patients with FM and it's explaining many of their headache symptoms and other symptoms. Well, what we found uh, at, at the end of the day was that there was uh, no association. There was no increased Chiari malformations in patients with fibromyalgia. In fact, when you looked at just tonsillar position related to the Bayesian Epistian line, that the fibromyalgia group, their tonsils were a little higher than the healthy uh, group, but there was no difference and there's, there's no clinical relevance to this, this uh, difference here. 
And there were, were the, no other differences in posterior fossa volume, ratio of brain to cerebrospinal fluid volume, and cerebrospinal fluid maximum systolic velocity at these regions. Uh, one area that we did find some differences was this pulsatile tissue velocity motion at the C2 uh, level and the foramen magnum. However, these values in both groups are within normal limits. And these findings uh, alone, without, uh, in isolation, don't provide any uh, necessarily clinical information. They're not diagnostic of anything. So we thought the most parsimonious interpretation of this data is that there's no association between fibromyalgia and Chiari malformations. Now that was looking at uh, the tonsillar position as a continuous variable, but then when we just uh, dichotomized it, do you have Chiari or not, based on whether or not there was a five millimeter difference, um, we also did not find a difference. So 2.8 percent of the FM group and 4.5 percent of the control group uh, had um, tonsillar descent, but they uh, didn't have any other findings or, uh, and so, it, and, and this is about what you might find in the general population if you're just randomly um, scanning people. So uh, th anyway, there was, there was no difference here uh, between these two groups, which I think, you know, highlights the importance of the fact that we, we did a, a controlled, uh, a case control study because many other reports indicating higher, uh, or indicating C1M in uh, FM were not controlled studies. And so uh, I think that that's where you can get into trouble and why our results are perhaps um, more fastidious is the fact that we did have a control group to show that even this 2.8 percent didn't, didn't, wasn't meaningful. There was no syringomyelia seen, no foramen magnum narrowing, or, or any of these other findings on uh, neuroimaging uh, in the FM group. So in conclusion on this study, it appears that FM is not associated with Chiari malformations. However, uh, there's this interesting notion of uh, a dynamic uh, imaging of the cervical spine or that dynamic movement of the cervical spine might actually be what's at play here. And uh, Dr. Andrew Holman down at Valley Medical Center has done a lot of research in this area. And we didn't do dynamic imaging of the cervical spine, and we only looked down to the C4 level. So it may, in fact, be that it's actually flexion extension, which creates uh, intermittent impingement on the cervical cord that is what's causing some of these problems. That has not been uh, proven one way or the other. Uh, so that question still remains to be answered, um, as well as the, the benefit, if any, of decompressive surgery in FM uh, you know, it hasn't been definitively answered. However, our data would suggest that it's probably uh, not of value to be doing that surgery in individuals with FM. Okay, um, so those were our first two studies that I did with uh, uh, Dr. Ellen Bogan's uh, leadership. And uh, lastly, we're going to talk about some sleep uh, disorders. And so this is, I uh, just want you to know that we're going to be talking about sleep apnea and not sleep rapnea, which is what this is which is a fairly rare disorder. <laughs> so uh, Chiari malformations can cause trouble with breathing, and particularly breathing at night, when your, your respiration is mostly controlled by uh, the oxygen and carbon dioxide levels in your blood and the way that your brain stem, as well as some peripheral chemoreceptors, sample that and, and tell you whether or not to breathe and how deeply. And so you can see that these ventral and dorsal respiratory groups here uh, would be uh, prone to being compromised in individuals that would have uh, Chiari malformations. Uh, not only that, but uh, there are a number of cranial nerves that can also be compromised in Chiari that ha have effects which can also contribute to sleep disorder breathing or sleep apnea. So in particular, uh, the glossopharyngeal nerve and the hypoglossal nerve which can control uh, muscular tone in the nose and throat uh, and tongue region, uh, which can, if they're compromised, can increase collapsibility of those areas and contribute to obstructive sleep apneas. And then also the glossopharyngeal and vagus, which uh, has some involvement in peripheral chemoreception, which can uh, help dictate when to breathe and how much to breathe when a person is asleep. So just to give you a, uh, an idea about what we're talking about here, this is obstructive sleep apnea. This is uh, 30 seconds of an overnight polysomnogram here. Uh, 
There's lots of squiggly lines and colors, uh, but don't let that uh, confuse you. This is just the brain waves up here. These are eye movements in blue. This is a chin muscle tone. We, we measure that because this drops out in REM sleep. EKG, snoring. This is chest and abdominal movement, so whether or not you're actually trying to breathe. Uh, this is uh, the pressure flow transducer, which indicates whether or not air is flowing. And then we have oxygen saturation leg movements to look for leg movements in sleep. And what you can see here, if we focus on this area, that you have um, uh, no airflow occurring in a repetitive manner here. And you have little indications of, of breathing in between in the setting of respiratory effort. So this is an obstructive sleep apnea. This is a person trying to breathe usually against a closed airway, not breathing very effectively. What typically happens, you have an oxygen desaturation during the event, then you have a cortical arousal where the patient wakes up just enough to open their airway. Often it's very insidious. The person's not aware that this is happening. It's just happening over and over and over again throughout the night. The only indication they might know that this is happening is if their wife is nudging them in the rib cage so that they stop snoring or they're quite sleepy during the day. Um, the uh, prevalence of uh, obstructive sleep apnea is 2 to 4% of the population will have an, what's called an apnea hypopnea index greater than 5, so they're having the respiratory events uh, more than 5 times an hour uh, and symptoms of insomnia or sleepiness. Uh, risk factors, you know, just being a man puts you at risk, having a few years behind you puts you at risk, but also uh, obesity or aspects of oropharyngeal anatomy, thick neck size, uh, those are the typical uh, uh, risk factors. And then the treatments are shown here, CPAP, continuous positive airway pressure therapy, which is a mask that you wear over your nose that pushes in pressurized humidified room air to keep the airway open, uh, mandibular advancement devices to move the jaw forward, or various surgical procedures such as uvulopalatopharyngeoplasty, which is what occurred in this individual uh, here. This is the standard treatment is CPAP, and that's the best treatment that we have. That's obstructive sleep apnea. What about central sleep apnea? This is much less common, uh, and this is different than obstructive sleep apnea in the sense that the obstructive individual is trying to breathe but can't. The central sleep apnea person is not trying to breathe. Okay, so what we see here, maybe we can see it best uh, on this side, that you're having no flow and no effort. Okay, and this is what we'll see in Chiari because uh, you know, those respiratory groups in the brainstem I showed you earlier, they're getting pressed on, uh, they're not functioning properly, and so they're not telling the person to breathe uh, the way that, that they should, and so these central apneas tend to come about. So in, in central sleep apnea, and I think in the individuals with uh, Chiari malformations that have central sleep apnea, they, they lose their wakefulness stimulus to breathe, so we all have that. When we're awake, we can control how much we're breathing a bit, because uh, we might think about it some, and we control it uh, in regards to when we're talking and not talking and things like that. Uh, but then, as I just mentioned, the issue of decreased respiratory motor output and, and then the, uh, the won't breathe factors, um, such as uh, 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 that, that can also affect uh, people with Chiari, the so-called uh, reduced chemosensitivity. So uh, if we look at uh, what's been done in Chiari malformations and sleep disorder breathing, this is a slide summarizing a number of studies uh, that uh, this one in particular studied 46 individuals with Chiari 1 malformations, which is a mixture of children and adults, and they found that uh, almost uh, three quarters of adults with Chiari had substantial sleep disorder breathing, predominantly obstructive but a non-insignificant portion had central sleep apneas as well. And again, in the usual sleep clinic, this is going to be quite rare. Um, and then also, many of the children that had Chiari malformations suffered from sleep apnea. So if you look at these uh, as prevalence estimates and compare it to what we see in the general population, you can see that individuals with Chiari malformations are, are very highly at risk of having problems breathing in their sleep. Um, and, and here's just another study that looked at 13. Uh, this is a case control study, looked at 13 uh, Chiari patients and 16 controls. And what they found uh, in this study, again, a higher apnea hypopnea index, so a higher number of respiratory events per hour, 13 compared to three uh, in the Chiari compared to the controls. Uh, 
Um, so sleep disorder breathing is more common in Chiari, 59% compared to 12%. And then they broke it down to look at some more specific details of the sleep study. So the Chiari individuals, their oxygen levels went lower, 80 was the, was the lowest it went compared to 90% in the controls. And the hypoxemic burden, this is the amount of time that the individual spends with a saturation below 90% during the night. Uh, much more uh, prevalent here in the Chiari group than the uh, con uh, control group. The Epworth sleepiness scale, which I'll tell you more about in a minute, but it's just a subjective indicator of sleepiness, was not different in this study between the two groups. So they were equally as sleepy. But again, central apneas were more common in the Chiari group, as expected. And, uh, <clears throat> and apparently this seemed to have something to do with basilar and vagination and, and the presence or not of syringomyelia, which might have some uh, diagnostic uh, utility when we see these patients in our clinic. So for our research project, uh, uh, basically we looked at Chiari patients who were recruited from Rich's specialty clinic. Uh, we had age-matched uh, controls recruited from the greater Seattle area. We did the MRIs uh, that I mentioned earlier. We had a number of subjective questionnaires that we uh, gave to these individuals. So just to go through these questionnaires briefly, the Berlin questionnaire is a measure of sleep apnea risk and uh, it's made out of 10 items in these three categories and high risk entails either frequent snoring or what we call witnessed apneas, frequent sleepiness, uh, and a body mass index that's in the obese range and in order to be high risk for sleep disorder breathing you had to be high risk in at least two of these three categories. So you had to have two of these three in order to be a high risk for sleep apnea. The Epworth sleepiness scale is, is a subjective measure of uh, sleepiness these are the eight items that we ask people. Um, an abnormal score is uh, greater than or equal to uh, 11. A maximum score is 24. Uh, you could maybe administer this to yourself very quickly right now and see where you fall out on that if you want to. Most of us are sleep deprived and sleepy, so we're probably going to score you know, somewhere in that range. But that was our sleepiness measure. And so if you look at the demographics on this, uh, study population, that the age was similar, education, the healthy controls were perhaps slightly more educated, um, gender, or excuse me, uh, uh, race was similar. Uh, these were all women, by the way, in this study. Um, and then employment was more common in the control group, uh, and marriage uh, was more common in the Chiari group. If we look at the Berlin questionnaire, the sleep apnea questions, uh, you can break it down by snoring, sleepiness, and hypertension and obesity. It's mostly the snoring and sleepiness where the differences were significant, but when you look for high risk out of two out of the three, you can see that our sleep apnea estimates were fairly similar, approaching the three quarters that we've seen previously for Chiari as compared to 20% in the healthy control group. If you break it down by specific uh, Questions or other questions related to sleep disorder breathing, such as waking up short of breath, choking and gasping, waking up with headaches, uh, waking up with heartburn. You can see all of these things um, were more common in the uh, Chiari group than the healthy controls. If we look at sleepiness, uh, as opposed to the other study that I showed, we did find an elevated amount of sleepiness in the Chiari group with an Epworth score of 10 which is right on the brink of being uh, elevated, with elevation being 11 or higher. Uh, and if you just look at what the percentage of the group that did score abnormal in the, uh, uh, on the Epworth, that 44% of the Chiari group were in the pathologic range of sleepiness compared to 9% of the controls. We also were interested in how long people sleep. And uh, we found that the Chiari groups didn't sleep as long as the controls and how long it took to fall asleep, and you can see the Chiari group, it took longer to fall asleep than the controls as well. So uh, I, that's uh, our research as well as some previous research that's been done showing this association between Chiari and sleep disordered breathing. I think it's typically going to be a mixture between obstructive and central sleep apnea, and sleepiness is going to be common. So it brings upon the next question is, what does doing a decompressive uh, surgery do to sleep disorder breathing in patients with Chiari malformations. And that's what this study looked at. And they found that uh, out of these, um, they had 16 patients with Chiari and syringomyelia who underwent PSG. 
Again, three quarters had sleep disorder breathing, almost half had central sleep apnea, so that would be half of this group here. And, uh, and then they were sleepy, so that's consistent with our findings. And they, when they, eight out of the 12 uh, with sleep apnea underwent surgical decompression, <clears throat> they did a post-op PSG, uh, and they found that the central apnea index decreased substantially. So that kind of makes sense, right? I mean, if we think it's the Chiari that's pressing on the brainstem causing problems breathing, you release that pressure that those central apneas should get better. The obstructive apnea index decreased as well, and that also makes sense. So that would take pressure off of uh, the glossopharyngeal, vagus, and hypoglossal nerves, allowing them to function better, allowing people to keep their airway open a bit better. The arousal index is just a measure of sleep fragmentation. Uh, on a sleep study, and that also improved. Uh, and uh, the overall, however, apnea hypopnea index did decrease, but it wasn't statistically significant. And there was no change in the Epworth sleepiness scale. So I think, you know, when we have patients with Chiari malformations and sleep disordered breathing, there's not a lot of evidence to guide us to indicate how much the sleep apnea is going to improve following decompression, but I think that this study does suggest that that some things will improve. In particular, I think we can count on the central apnea index uh, getting better. And so we might want to uh, reserve surgery for sleep apnea in C1M for in patients that have predominantly central sleep apnea. So in conclusion, what, we, what this last research study showed was that uh, individuals with Chiari are at higher risk of sleep disordered breathing than controls of similar sex and age, that the Chiari group is sleepier than the controls, uh, they, they sleep less and they take longer to fall asleep, so sleep is, is overall disrupted in this group. Um, that all Chiari patients should be evaluated for sleep disorder breathing, even if it's just asking them if they're sleepy, if they snore, uh, if they're having insomnia problems. Uh, that future studies we should focus on these objective measures of, uh, well, sleepiness, which is the MSLT, sleep duration for actigraphy as well as sleep apnea for the PSG, both pre and post decompression to get an idea of what effect we're having with surgery. And that uh, surgical treatment can improve sleep disorder breathing predominantly by reducing the central apnea index. So I'd like to acknowledge uh, the group that did this research with me, uh, Dr. Ellen Bogan in particular, uh, as well as Dr. Buckwald in the Department of Medicine. Uh, and uh, Carolyn Noonan was key in doing the statistical analysis. Uh, Dr. Maravilla in Guan did the uh, MRI work, and Suzanne Hartman and Bethany Osterman, who helped recruit the subjects for these studies. And with that, I thank you for your attention.